all kinds of matters, ranging from uh, what Newsweek calls the shockingly irreverent to the simply silly. So let's meet the composer of such unforgettable hits as I'm Everyone I Ever Loved and Noses Run in My Family. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I'm delighted to welcome Martin Mull. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, that's completely unnecessary. Please sit down. <laughs> Thank you. Don't pull it off till tomorrow What you can do today Don't leave things half finished Thank you. Uh, that's, uh, that's all I've really done on that. <laughs> this is really a, a thrill here to be a guest in your country and to be with Bob and so forth and so on. And I uh, dabble in comedy from time to time, and I thought if we were going to do that, since that is the general thrust of the show, uh, rather than be on thin ice, I should find out whether or not we're on the same wavelength in terms of what comedy is. So if I could indulge you for a second, I'd like to do a little comedy test before we go any further and make sure we are on that same wavelength. Because there are a couple of different kinds of comedy. Uh, type one and, of course, type two would be those, those two. Uh, you know, why don't we start with one? Um, <clears throat> this is a, a type of comedy, um, a personal favorite of mine. It's a little bit more literate. Um, in fact, it happened, well, this joke happened while we were traveling here on holiday. We were up uh, at um, one of the colleges up north and uh, happened to be uh, overhearing a couple of English professors um, you know, swapping jokes the way only they can. And I thought, uh, this will be type one. It, it turns out that Byron and Shelley were very, very, very good friends. I guess you, you all know that, okay. Uh, no, that is true. Okay, at uh, any rate, uh, some evening, I don't know what happened, but Shelley ended up being arrested and thrown in jail for some misdemeanor, I'm sure. But anyway, of course, uh, Shelley being in jail, Byron being his best friend would, of course, come to visit him, okay. That's, that's not the joke, but uh, it, 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 it goes on from there. Uh, and so, all right, picture this. J Shelley is in jail behind bars. And Byron comes down the hall to, to visit his friend who's been incarcerated. And, and he takes one look at Shelley in jail and he says, Shelley, what the heck are you doing in there? Okay. <laughs> no, that's not it. That's not it. And, and, and so Shelley looks back out at Byron, who's walking down the hallway, a free man. And he said, well, Byron, what are you doing out there? <laughs> okay, that's type one. Uh, <laughs> type two. These two fat black Mexican lesbians go into a pay toilet. One of them just eating a whole of baked beans right over her head, wearing hip boots. All right, I think we understand each other here. I guess, I guess that ocean isn't quite as wide as I thought. Um, obviously, I know what you folks want tonight. You want to hear good, solid, well-played, well-executed, maybe even just a smidge meaningful bossa nova music. Am I right? Okay, I knew it. Almost a fifth sense that I have. <laughs> if that's the case, then we're in big trouble. And by we, of course, <laughs> by we, of course, I am referring to myself. Not that I can't play bossa nova music. Let's face it, it's made in Latin America. How hard could it be? <laughs> No, I, I, I can play it all right, and I write it as well. The problem is how I write it. I write it sort of what you would call, I guess, uh, I guess it's an international phrase, stream of consciousness, or, or in this case, um, puddle of consciousness. I guess it's more like it. It's not really moving water, but um, <laughs> it has a few words in it that may not be right for, for everyone here tonight, and I don't really know what to do about that. I don't want to certainly step on, on the toes of my my guest country, or my host country, rather. But uh, at the same time, I don't want to shortchange you and give you anything less than the real bossa nova. So I, the only thing I can think of is that I could sing you the song anyway. And if I come to a word or a phrase or something that might be questionable or in kind of a blue area or something, I could hum those words. And that way, uh, you people who are a little too old or a little too young or have been to America or whatever your problem is, uh, <laughs> 
you'll have nothing to worry about. And, and you people who are pretty darn hip, and I think you know who you are, right? <laughs> Wrong. Um, no, you, you'll know what I'm, I'm talking about anyway. This is London. You probably even know it. But <laughs> at any rate, this will be a little bossa nova number, and I will hum anything I think is offensive. And I hope you enjoy it. Last night I took you home And we began to hmm. You were such a hmm. Rubber shirts, mm -hmm, leather skirts, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, and a case of Vaseline. Pick up the soap. Mayonnaise and rope. Then from the chandelier, the three of us. Mm -hmm. Brother's wife. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You'll need some water after that. This is wonderful. They have no taste at all. No, not at all. <laughs> <laughs> You're not lacking in flavor, but you no. are lacking in style. I would never disassociate myself from you. That is, I've seen you do that in America, and I've been stunned at the way the audience will respond to it. Well, I think everyone enjoys a good bossa nova from time to time. <laughs> <laughs> You've broken down more frontiers. You, what happened to, um, in a series we saw very briefly in Britain called Mary Hartman, Mary Hartman. Right. You played the wife-beating Bath Gimbal in that series. Right. A beast. He was, uh, that was a very difficult acting job, too. I'd never acted before, not counting my draft physical. <laughs> and, uh, and to all of a sudden go from stand-up comedy to being a, a serious kind of Virginia Wolfish kind of wife beater was difficult. They destroyed him in the end of that series. Mm -hmm. Yes, he, uh, he had a little too much of the sauce one night and uh, got impaled on an, as you say, aluminum Christmas tree. Right. Right through, right through the thorax, and as he lied there on the ground, Jingle Bells was still playing with a little angle. <laughs> and that and was, was the... touching. <laughs> but, but you were out of a job. I mean, I, is that, was that the end of Gimbal? No, what happened is I, I approached the producer, a fellow named Norman Lear, and I said, has anyone ever asked to come back as their twin brother? And he said, everyone has. Because <laughs> it's called looking for work, isn't it? <laughs> And so, instead of being Garth Gimble, I came back as Barth Gimble and... Uh, Barth, Barth Gimble. And hosted a little show called Fernwood Tonight, which was possibly the lowest rent talk show to ever hit American television. It was... Fernwood was supposedly... It was a fictitious town in Ohio, which is um, sort of a... I guess it's like sort of like Milton Keynes, I guess. Uh, sort of that kind of... Only, only smaller. Um, <laughs> that gives us the picture. I think so. Yeah. And... We would just sit around in tacky furniture and uh, have certain guests on. We had a situation once, for instance, where the, the officer in town had noticed that they'd stopped the speeder in town. The, his last name was, uh, was Steinberg. And in this town, out in, out in the provinces as we were, we had never had a Jew, ever. So we thought, what a wonderful guest. So we opened up our phone lines and actually had, as a segment of our show, a, a part of the show called Talk to a Jew. <laughs> and, <laughs> And we gave the phone number over the air, 555-something-something-something-something, five, 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 and said, okay, our phone lines are open, now it's time to talk to a Jew. <laughs> and we sat there. <laughs> and we sat there. 
And finally the phone rang, and the first question was something like, when is Barbara Streisand's next movie coming out? <laughs> it was fairly low rent. But you were this, <laughs> this silky, smooth, tasteless host of this terrible small town talk show. Yes. What other kind of guests would you attract? We, uh, well, during the period of time when cults were very big, there were all sorts of people being taken off and, and the, the sons or daughters are being uh, taken back home by their parents and they have to be deprogrammed. We have a, have a segment where uh, one fellow, uh, the parents came on complaining bitterly that their son had gone off to join this sect. I mean, you mean as in Scientology or the moon is? Right, something like that. But in this case, they said that the sect that he was uh, part of, they wore nothing but black. He hung around with nothing but men. He read the same book over and over again, and they just felt that he really should be taken away from there and reprogrammed back into society. And we asked what the name of the, the group was, and they said it was the Catholic Church. And, <laughs> and so we asked our audience for a show of hands as to whether or not he should be deprogrammed or not, and 90% uh, said yes, and we brought out a, a person to deprogram him. Surgically <laughs> removed his dog collar. That's right. <laughs> what about the No Frills Hospital plan? Now that was very popular. Yeah, we uh, a lot of people realize the hospital bills are going up and up and up. We had a No Frills Hospital plan. What they would do is they would wait until they had 35 or 40 people all with the same malady. You know, if if it's gallbladder or appendicitis, let's wait till we have a group. <laughs> we can do it faster, quicker. We don't have to wash the instruments off afterward. <laughs> We can keep the same thing moving down the line, that type of thing. The, uh, the surgery would actually be performed by a registered nurse who would be within walkie-talkie control uh, with a doctor on a golf course. <laughs> so you're insured of at least some sort of quality. And, and also there was a used flower shop, since a lot of the deceased, you know, they don't see the flowers after they're buried, and the flowers are still quite alive. Bring them back, sell them again. <laughs> That's what we thought. So it was kind of a no-frills hospital plan, and the interesting thing was there were a number of people, uh, in Florida in particular, that called up the station literally wanting to know how to get a, uh, to be a part of this. <laughs> so, so if show business falls out, I'm going to open that up as a side <laughs> Do some, some, some new television programming. You know, I have trouble sometimes. A, a show, in fact, since a lot of it does come over here, maybe I could try it on your audience and see if they'd be interested. It's a show called Frontier Gynecologist. It's a, it would be a Western, and it would start out, I see, sort of in one of those Western 1800 saloons with a, one of those girls with the push up things coming up to a guy saying, Hi, Tex. Cut to another girl coming up to another guy saying, Hi, a buck. Cut to another person saying, Hi, a slim. And then the voiceover would say, but no one said, hi, Gene, until <laughs> Frontier Gyno. And yeah. then you see this guy on a horse riding in, and his stirrups are straight up in the air. <laughs> <laughs> it's usually at that point I'm thrown out of the office. Yes. <laughs> I can't, I, nowhere in our conversation tonight, which I've enjoyed greatly, have we touched on your great, great enthusiasm, your love for the folk music of early America. Well... First of all, I was involved uh, in the folk music scare of the 60s uh, back in the United States. That was a period when that stuff almost caught on. It was, it, was, it was pretty close. It was, you know, like all these people sitting around in parks singing, We Shall Overcome. I mean, what a thing to sing about, Bob. <laughs> <laughs> to me, that's between you, your spouse, and your doctor, and it is not something that, <laughs> that should be just bandied about in public and in parks it, it embarrassed me but um, <laughs> still my ability to stay young which is obviously working so well um, <laughs> I, I link that up to my my concern for American folk music I try to keep in touch with it it's it's the young people what are the young people doing what are they thinking boy that's important to me <laughs> but, <laughs> but um, I, I was curious at one point as to what the first folk music ever made in America was, and I came across it quite by accident. I was on the road, and I'm sure you've done that too. You're traveling from hotel to hotel to hotel. And I was all alone. I wasn't married as, as I am now, and I was single up in the room, you know, just me in the room and lonely. Mm -hmm. And so I decided to go out and find, I think we can say this is just several hundred of us here tonight, um, <laughs> a little companionship. So I went out and I found what I thought was going to be the perfect companion for an evening like that. It was a book. <laughs> it was a book called Girl to Grab. Wow. Yeah, that's what I thought. 
I said, wow, this is it. This is pay dirt. And so I asked him to put it in the brown wrapping. And, uh, <laughs> took it back to my room, unwrapped it after I had triple locked the door, and uh, <laughs> brought the fellows up behind me, opened it up. Can you imagine my surprise when Girl to Grab turned out to be volume six of the Encyclopedia Britannica? <laughs> I felt about that big, which uh, was just the opposite of what I had in mind. Oddly <laughs> 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 enough, I have volume four, which is called How to Hug, which really? I also thought was going to be very helpful. And I have a very curious one called Raspberries to Reagan. You might like to take that <laughs> That sounds very nice. <laughs> but as long as I had this crack reference book in front of me, I decided to look up folk music and find out what the first music ever made in the United States was, because that would be our real folk music. And I was quite surprised to find out the first folk music in America wasn't even made in America. It was made a few miles offshore, actually, uh, by Columbus and his merry men as they were sailing to our new land. 1492. That's right. It was in the, within the three-mile limit, though, so it is legally ours. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and we have drilling rights, I think, in the song. <laughs> And they had all the lyrics printed out, and I just thought it'd be wonderful if we could share that tonight. Actually, it, it, you're wondering how we're going to do that. You know, where did they put the instruments on that, those ships? They didn't use any. They, it was all done a kind of music they call Al Capella, which was named for the chef who was on the uh, <laughs> on one of the boats, and uh, he 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 made up the lyrics and he directed the orchestra. And then there was uh, Colonel Shrapstein, I believe he also had the publishing on it. But uh, <laughs> they all got up on deck, and. They paint a certain picture of it, the men kind of scantily clad and Al Capella directing the orchestra, etc. And I thought maybe in the spirit of international understanding, we could maybe do America's first folk song here tonight. Would that be all right? Oh, yes. Would you like to know? This involves the, our audience here? Yes, I would very much like to call upon your help uh, to help me do this. Since it is a cappella, we won't be using instruments, uh, or certainly nothing that I consider an instrument. We'll be using drums. Uh, <laughs> Oh, don't laugh. A drummer is a musician's best friend. <laughs> so, if, if you <laughs> so if you'd like to help me out, that'd be terrific. Wendy, can we have a, a, a D, I think it is? Um, 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 everybody. Um, 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 um. All right, that's good. That's the waves, though. Huh? How about some seagulls? Anyone do seagulls? Um, okay. Um, okay, picture the men are on deck. Um, 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 um. It's great to be on a ship with men and sail across the sea. Oh, we don't know where we'll land or when. Great to be with men. It's great to be with men. Cause men can sweat and men can stink and no one seems to care. Oh, we'll throw the dishes in the sink. Clog the drain with hair. Oh, clog the drain with hair. Oh, Men, 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 it's a ship all filled with men. So batten down the ladies' room, there's no one here but men, 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 men. Now, men, 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 here's the men, 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 men. Come on, men. Men, 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 men. Come on, ladies, too. Men, men. There's men above, there's men below, there's men down in the galley. There's Butch and Spike and Buzz and Biff. One guy we call Sally, one guy we call Sally. Men, 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 it's a ship all filled with men. You'll never have to lift the seat. There's no one here but men. Men, 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 modulate. Men, 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 men. We're men and friends until the end, and none of us are sissies. At night we sleep in separate beds and blow each other kiss. Men, 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 it's a ship all filled with men. No matter that your zipper's down, there's no one here but men.
Modern Mao, Modern Mao. Modern gave us their rare piece of American folk music.